What's good YouTube? Welcome back. Thank you for clicking onto this reaction. I hope you're looking forward to it just as much as I am. If you haven't already, head over to the content creators page. That link is in the description box down below. If you haven't already and you're enjoying our content, you know what you need to do. You need to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, but we're gonna jump straight into this one. All right, we'll jump straight into it and then we'll go from there. If it, uh, if the system's struggling, you guys, like, if it's jumping, the video's jumping and I'm jumping, let me know and I'll stop it and close the game down. But I just want to see if it can work or not. All right. So we'll jump into this reaction. Three, two, one, go. Oh, it's not working. Oh, no, there we go. During the second half of the 12th century, a dramatic Muslim revival reaches its zenith under the command of Salah ad din Yusuf ibn Ayyub, a courageous and brilliant leader known to contemporary Muslims as Al-Nasir, the victorious, and to Europeans as Salah ad din mm -hmm. He seeks nothing less than to unite all Muslims between the Euphrates and the Nile against a common enemy. Which is something we noticed throughout the, the whole uh, series we just watched. In the late 11th century, the Fatimid Caliphate is in decline and the Seljuk Empire is crumbling. Mm -hmm. In this period of Muslim weakness, the First Crusade strikes the Levant. Christian lords and knights impose institutions. I like how we're getting a bit backstory for um, the First Crusades. Obviously, we covered it in some of our reactions, but I like that he's sort of mentioning it to sort of set up uh, the, the backstory of what's leading on to the Third Crusade. ...of Western Europe upon the social and political structures of the conquered lands. Their rule is relatively stable, largely mm -hmm. thanks to Muslim disunity. But as the 12th century rolls on, less than five decades since European crusaders arrived in the region, the Zengid dynasty rises to prominence in Northern okay. Levant. Under competition... I think it's funny that he said that the uh, Crusader states are doing well due to the uh, the um, the non-unity between the Muslim countries. Because I'd imagine it would be quite easy to do the same thing in the European country because of there's no unity between all the Europeans. So, do you know what I mean? It's just a bit of a double standard saying it there because I think it would be the same situation. It would be quite easy to do it in, in Europe. Because everyone's sort of uh, fragmented. Under the leadership of Imad Nadin Zengi, they defeat the Crusaders and retake the city of Edessa in 1144. Thus, in effect, provoking the Pope to call for the Second Crusade. And that one didn't go so Although great, did Imad it? Imad is assassinated two years later in 1146. His son Nur ad Din successfully continues the fight against the Crusaders until. Any reason? Do we know the reason why he was assassinated? Um. Yeah, he just can't write history. The Second Crusade eventually fizzles out, and he expands his father's realm over the years, bringing much-needed stability and prosperity to his people. Mm -hmm. It is during Nur ad Din's reign that Saladin begins his rise to prominence. So this is when we start sort of seeing it, it, his uh, story start developing. Then, born in 1137 in Tikrit. In modern-day Iraq, Salah ad din spends his formative years in Damascus. From a young age, he is educated in Greek philosophy, mathematics, poetry, astronomy, law, and above all, he becomes an ardent student of the Quran and theology. His so he's very well educated, which once again, very interesting. Uh, uh, it's interesting to see, because they were so close to Greek and uh, Greek, uh, dominance during that period of time that is still sort of the philosophy so was still taught to other religions and stuff like that as well. That's really interesting to me um, to sort of get the ability of their culture and other cultures, you know. Um, yeah, but the Crusades rallied every time there was an external threat, unlike the Muslims during the. F um, yeah, they did rally, but it was all for personal greed. It wasn't actually for one real reason. Maybe once or twice it was for a real reason, but I w I'd say a lot of the time it was for internal greed. Um, more than anything, that that's the reason why they went uh, in the First Crusade. I'm not so sure about the others because we haven't covered them as much yet. Um, 
Yeah. upbringing is helped by members of his family who served as skillful diplomats and administrators first in the Seljuk Empire and later for the Zengid dynasty uh, once again so he's getting that experience of um, just being around uh, diplomats and being around courts and um, how to operate within those sort of situations um, for his family growing up Saladin's uncle Shakur and Nur ad Din become his biggest role models. Oh, okay. They instilled in him the principles of chivalry, piety, nobility, justice, humility, generosity, brotherhood, mercy, and forgiveness, all of which would come to define Saladin's life and legacy. Oh, that's that's really cool. Okay, thank you for just suggesting this video. I'm enjoying finding out a bit more about him himself. Uh, and a bit more about his pre uh, prehistory. Yeah, this is really really enjoyable. A lot more in depth. Um, yeah, and I'm enjoying sort of staying on the same little subject for a little bit. He joins the military at the age of 14 and is hmm. ably trained by his uncle Shakur, a military commander in the Zengid army. A quick learner, Saladin soon impresses his mentor. Nice. His performance Sweet in one. early battles enables him to take on leading responsibilities in military campaigns, and over the years, he distinguishes himself through his bravery, military leadership, sharp intellect, and loyalty to his leaders. Very nice. Sharp intellect, his bravery, loyalty is what you really, really need as well. That loyalty is a big, big thing. Saladin star and once again, it sort of shows... In the other um, video, we've got a lot of that, and it sort of shows it here uh, where it sort of come from, which is really, really interesting. I'd also like to know about his two role models as well, um, and why they were sort of... I know there were a few reasons why they gave us why they were his role models, but I really want to know sort of a bit more about them. ...are truly begins to rise in the 1160s, when Nur ad Din intervenes in the affairs of the weakening Fatimid Caliphate. In okay. To forestall Amalric's quest to expand mm -hmm. the Kingdom of Jerusalem into Egypt. Recognized as a competent, trustworthy, and ambitious leader, in 1164, Saladin is sent to Egypt as part of the command structure of a Zengid army. Command oh, nice. We're about to get the backstory of how he got Egypt properly, and then, hopefully. He becomes an integral part of several campaigns over the years, mm -hmm. and his uncle's second in command. Oh, so he's got some promotion there. He's become his uncle's second command. He's getting battlefield knowledge. Very nice. The army of Amalric I, king of Jerusalem, is finally expelled from Egypt. Mm -hmm. Saladin's uncle Shakur is named vizier of the Fatimid Caliph al Adid, which gives Nur ad Din de facto control nice. over Egypt. But just one month later, in March 1169, Shakur suddenly dies after a short illness. This is how he gets to uh, power. Nur ad Din's influence in Egypt is threatened. Al Adid senses an opportunity to strengthen his own position and quickly appoints Salah ad Din without waiting for a decision mm -hmm. from Damascus, thinking that a young vizier with no political power in Egypt will isn't going to do much. Control. What a fool and what a mistake he has made. He's not going to be easy control at all, is he? Yeah, it is a shame that only certain uh, historical figures are covered. So um, it's a shame that they're not going to be um, covered on YouTube and that won't be able to get found out anymore. But when I sort of say this information, I'm also like sort of um, looking for articles to read and things like that. A lot of these uh, historical things I'd actually really like to read into. Um, if you have like links to actual pages that have the actual information on, like all that sort of stuff I really enjoy as well. So yeah, definitely, if you do know any sort of direct links and where I could sort of find them, that would be really, really cool. However, the 31-year-old Saladin proves to be more than what al has bargained for. The young vizier takes advantage of the mm -hmm. Fatimid political system, and through clever tactics, <laughs> he gradually installs his close family members in key government and military positions. And like I said in the uh, extra history version, of course you're going to put your family in there. But it's quite interesting how um, 
This one says he gradually installs his uh, close family. He didn't immediately do it. So obviously in this, it's showing that he's um, subvertedly taking power and undermining people, which he wasn't sort of covered in the last one. So I'm really liking that. Which enables him to consolidate his power enough to overthrow and dissolve the Fatimid Shia Caliphate just two years later in 1171. Okay. Founding the Ayyubid dynasty. That's how he done it. Saladin can now concentrate on very smart like um way of getting power strengthening egypt as a bastion of sunni muslim <clears throat> power with himself as governor in the name of nur -Adin. he revitalizes the economy establishes civic institutions and greatly improves education by building a law college in alexandria and a vast number of schools all over egypt giving school administrators and teachers good salaries which attracts many scholars from across asia and europe turning egypt Egypt into an intellectual powerhouse of the 12th century. Once again, um, it shows what type of man he is, and I think that's really, really good. I think anyone who's trying to better the education and better the life for their people understands that the better their lives for them, the more likely they're going to be able to better your state and better your economy. Better, f <clears throat> sorry, two seconds. <coughs> Better funded troops, better educated troops are just better troops. Better educated citizens are just more likely to get you uh, more finance and better economy. So, of course, those are things you're going to want to do. And it's really, really good that he prioritized those types of things. He abolishes tolls for Muslim pilgrims who cross the Red Sea and pays compensation to Mecca for any loss of income. A shrewd okay. move that makes him popular among the people mm, and also very makes smart. him a patron of Mecca. Salad. Nice, nice. So he's getting Mecca on his side as well. Dean transforms Egypt into a salient against the Crusaders by creating an entirely new army, loyal only to him. Oh, but once again, he's really taking the fight against the Crusaders. He's really not happy about uh, what they've done, which is fair. Military forays soon followed to secure and expand the borders. First against Nubia, where hostile remnants of the Fatimid establishment I was trying to expand. still persist. So he's trying to expand other places as well. Ayyubid armies push west to Tripoli and expel the Norman occupiers. Very interesting. So it wasn't just the Crusaders he was after. He's willing to do a lot more as well. Although Saladin never manages to consolidate his authority west of the province of Barca. Mm. Most importantly, Saladin turns his attention towards tightening his grip over Hejaz and captures Yemen, thus gaining control over the Red Sea and its vast maritime trading potential, which immensely increases Egypt's commercial wealth. By all Once again, just showing that he's willing to see what's going to uh, what's best to capitalize on and to get the best result. Um, he's really expanding a lot. Saladin's doing a hell of a lot here hell of a lot i'm really enjoying this video and finding out how he's sort of um slowly gaining more power than the rest and how he is getting certain people on his side and he's not able to get the others on his side all accounts saladin is actively building an empire which creates friction with nur Adin, his master in syria tensions rise and almost result in conflict but then nur Adin dies suddenly in 1174 okay of a heart attack once again, just can't write here history. In the ensuing power vacuum, his 11-year-old son, al Sali cannot fill the void left by his father's mm -hmm. death. But Saladin can. And he now sees before him a grand vision. He can mm. unite Egypt and Syria for a holy war against the Christian invaders. He proclaims the need for unity and jihad as reasons to intervene in Syria. And his claims are not without merit. By controlling the Red Sea, or by reconquering the area south of the Shorbak Castle, Saladin is already recognized as the liberator of the Hajj Road. Yeah, he's got a... He's also just done a lot. He seems to have done a lot, and I would understand why people are rallying, rallying, in, rallying towards him, you know? Securing pilgrimage routes from Sudan and Egypt to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina earns him a lot of credibility. And as a result, his arrival into Syria is much welcomed by ordinary people, but not so much by some members of the Zengid dynasty. 
Nevertheless, Saladin brings most of the Zenki territory under his control, mm. either through diplomacy or military intervention. Thus nice. Once again, just showing how how well he's doing, not only militarily but diplomatically, gaining so much power just over. I'd imagine it's such a little time. Do you know what I mean? It's over his lifespan. So, do you know what I mean? It's it's a little amount of time, really. If you think about it in history, <clears throat> the Sultan of Egypt and Syria. Meanwhile, across the border, King Amalric plans to exploit the political instability in Syria and expand his territory. But he again, once again, just trying to take advantage or something. He dies of dysentery in July 1174. Oh, that was a. Uh... Sorry, do apologise. I thought that was Saladin, but it wasn't. Death is a sign of God's favour. Mm -hmm. With the throne passing to Baldwin IV, a mere boy suffering from leprosy, and the Frankish nobles angling for positions in the kingdom. Okay, so we're pretty much up to date. We're pretty much up to date here. I'm just, I, there just might be extra little details uh, that I get. The threat of a major <coughs> Christian invasion subsides. But Saladin knows that the time is not yet right to fight the Crusaders, mm -hmm. as he must consolidate his position against Nur ad-Din's relatives, who still pose a threat from their bases in Aleppo and Mosul. But as Baldwin IV matures, the kingdom adopts a proactive foreign policy. The Crusaders try to take Hama and Harim, but fail in the attempt. Okay. In 1177, Saladin responds by leading a large invasion force into the Kingdom of Jerusalem to counter mm. the Frankish aggression. Baldwin, now 16 years old, despite being vastly outnumbered, proves he is a capable leader, able to unite his nobles against the Muslim threat, and with the help of Reynaud of Châtillon, his second in command, he manages to catch Saladin by surprise at Montgizard, due to a okay. rare tactical error by the Sultan. Okay, interesting. Aladdin suffers a crushing defeat, narrowly escaping with his own life, with many of his army killed or taken prisoner. Mm -hmm. But Baldwin lacks the resources to follow up on the victory, and the Sultan manages to regroup. Yeah, I remember this. In April 1179, Saladin strikes back and decisively defeats Baldwin in the Golan region, nearly capturing the king. Mm -hmm. Another Christian army is defeated in June of the same year. And just two months later, an important Templar fortress situated on the pilgrimage route is destroyed. Just weakening the uh, in eleven eighty defenses. Saladin and Baldwin agree a two year truce. But even before the ink is dry I was about to say there is no way that truce was gonna last. And again, once once again, a true two year truce is just trying to trying to appease people. That's all they're trying to do, right? Trying to appease people around him. Go, oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to be peaceful. It is clear that the mighty fortress of Karak will become the next flashpoint. Virtually impenetrable, atop a steep hill, with its 80 meter entrance tunnel and walls thick enough to withstand the battering of siege weapons, Karak is the home of Reynaud of Chatillon. His okay. fortress sits on the key road between Damascus and Mecca. And from there, the Baron is able to tax, Ooh. raid, and rob the passing camel caravans of traders and pilgrims. So of course it's going to be of high value. I understand why they want to go for that. Makes complete sense. Truce or no truce, Reynaud thinks that Muslims should not be allowed to pass freely. Mm -hmm. In the summer of 1181, he rides deep into a so he's the reason why the truce isn't up, up, uh, upheld. So he's the problem. Arabia and intercepts a major Muslim caravan, <clears throat> strips the travelers of their possessions, and takes many prisoners. Saladin demands compensation from Baldwin, but the king cannot force Reynaud to recompense. Saladin holds a group of Christian pilgrims hostage as leverage. Which, which is a hundred percent like. 100% fair. 100% fair. The, the man should be held accountable and Baldwin should do something, right? But Reynold still refuses to free the Muslim pilgrims. In response, <clears throat> Christian pilgrims are sold into slavery. Then in 1182, Reynold. I remember that. Yeah, 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 I do remember that. It's more strain on the already delicate truce. The rogue crusader sends troops via the Red Sea 
declaring that he will destroy the Kaaba and exhume the Prophet's tomb in Hejaz. But thanks to Saladin's naval reforms, Egypt is well prepared. Mmm, strong. Al-Adil, Saladin's brother and governor of Egypt, dispatches the Ayyubid fleet. Most of the Christian raiders are captured and executed on the orders from the Sultan. Eulogies of Saladin abound in the Muslim community as he is yet again seen as the protector of Islamic holy places and pilgrimage routes. Just building that aura up around him again, isn't he? And then the tide turns in favour of the Muslims. In 1183, Aleppo finally surrenders to Saladin, who now becomes the mightiest ruler of the Muslim world mm -hmm. and the leader of a unified Muslim front against the Latin Crusaders. Exercising uncontested authority over Egypt and Syria, he is supported by the Sunni Caliph in Baghdad and is recognized as the Lord of Arabia and patron of the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. The most important... Wow, 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 oh, wow. And like you said, he was like one of the only Muslim leaders that was remembered around this point in time. Ordinary Muslims that Saladin sought to bring together are jubilant that Islam is again united. The news of Saladin's conquest of Aleppo shocks the Crusader states. Saladin can now direct his. Sorry, so I got the first bit of that. The Christians knew that Saladin could conquer that city, then their country could be swept and besieged in every part. Saladin can now direct his vast resources to put pressure on the Kingdom of Jerusalem almost along its entire border. A devastating okay. raid into Christian lands is followed by several probing attacks on the fortress of Karak, testing the resolve of the Franks and putting strain on their resources. Hmm. To make matters worse for the Crusaders, the tragic life of Baldwin IV is over. The king's final act was to try and secure peace by sending Raymond of Tripoli to negotiate a four-year truce, which Saladin readily agrees to because he has problems of his own with the Zengid ruler in Mosul, who is forming a coalition against him. Okay. But the leper king's successor, Baldwin V, is a sickly child, mm -hmm. and he dies just a year later, triggering a succession crisis. After which we covered last time. Turmoil, the throne passes on to Baldwin the fourth sisters, sister, and then she ma marries husband, Guy of Lusignan as yeah. king of Jerusalem. But the new king is not able to control his vassal nobles. Mm -hmm. Then comes troubling news from the south. In December 1186, Reynaud of Chatillon once again violates the truce. He overruns another. Mate, this guy needs to go. You need to make him pay for, like. He needs repercussions for his actions. Like, this is twice now. Like, there's a truce. There's a goddamn fucking truce. I'm sick of your crap. Sick of your crap. Rich caravan slaughters and imprisons many Muslims. Dickhead. Aladdin immediately dispatches an envoy, demanding the return of hostages and treasure, threatening the truce breaker with vengeance. But Reynold? Resting on his laurels behind the walls of Karak, refuses to even receive the envoy. What? On hearing of this, Saladin finally loses his patience and mm -hmm. swears that he will take the life of Reynold with his own hand. His anger beyond words. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I would do the same thing. He's got to go. He's just got to go. Beyond bounds. In early 1187, Saladin gathers his generals in Damascus to draw up plans for a major invasion. Messengers gallop to all corners of the state, urging okay. action, vengeance, a war of liberation and annihilation. The words Jihad and Jerusalem are on the lips of all Muslims mm. who answer Saladin's call. Once again, it's understandable if these atrocities just keep being, like, taken, like... Like, you would do whatever you wanted, like, if it was happening to you, you would also do the same thing to the opposition, do you know what I mean? And just, you would dehumanise them so that you could um, just make them the enemy so that it was easier to go against them. 
And especially if they're doing things to justify that reason, it's even easier, isn't it, at the end of the day? Saladin leaves garrisons along the border to protect the northern flank and begins raiding Christian lands. During one of the raids, a chance encounter between a Muslim cavalry advance guard and a Christian contingent of 130 knights, 410 capoles, and infantry at the springs of Cresson ends in disaster. Okay. And hospitaliers. Heads of knights on lances and prisoners chained to horses are paraded in front of Tiberius. Mm -hmm. The calamity at the springs of Cresson is a wake-up call for the Christians, who quickly mend old rivalries and unite in the face of the conflict that is coming. We covered this one, right? This bit. On June 26th, 1187, yeah, 100%. Saladin that is a problem. Just violence always causes more violence. And I mean, it always just escalates into bigger and bigger things. You know, you see it uh, all throughout um, the world. You see it on big scale and small scale. Do you know what I mean? But it's just a repetitive cycle. Uh, it's a very good point to sort of bring up that uh, it just gets escalated. You see it in street life. You see it in uh, country, like uh, country politics. Um, you just did see it throughout the whole entire world, community-based, uh, political base, you know, um, just in general. All of these things that cause violence then cause more violence, cause the, the opposition to, to get just as angry and justified for what they do next. And it's just a repetitive cycle, endless cycle. And I don't know if we would ever, it would be such a struggle to break that cycle. It'd be, it'd be too difficult. We don't know, we're not advanced enough as a society to do that yet. Uh, yeah, but, but we're definitely trying. Groups his troops and marches towards the River Jordan. His army numbers around 30,000 and is divided into three wings, with Taki Adin commanding mm -hmm. the right, Kukburi commanding the left, and Saladin himself in the center. Yeah. On June 27th, the army reaches the River Jordan and makes camp in a marshy area near Lake Tiberius. Raiding parties are sent into Christian territory to ravage the area and set the stage for the invasion. Some 25 kilometers west because of its rich water resources. On June 30th, Saladin sends a contingent north to block the town of Tiberius and then challenges the Crusaders by moving his main camp closer to Sephuria, some 10 kilometers west of Lake Tiberius. All right. But as neither side takes action, Saladin decides to make the first move. On July 1st, he sends scouts to monitor an alternative road on his northern flank that connects Sephuria and Tiberius. Later in the day, reports confirm that the Crusaders are not advancing on either route. Mm, and on July interesting. 2nd, Saladin takes the initiative. He marches east towards Tiberius with most of his infantry, a cavalry contingent, siege engineers, and their equipment. Nice. By late morning, they reach Tiberius, where Raymond's wife is staying and they besiege the town. Not long after, Muslim troops breach the wall and the town is seized by nightfall. Mm. Raymond's wife barricades herself inside the citadel with her guards and sends messengers urging King Guy to send help. Okay, okay. Back west, plumes of smoke can be seen in the sky above Tiberius and when news of the siege reaches the Crusader camp, King Guy holds a war council to debate what should be done. Okay, At nice. First, Raymond of Tripoli makes a persuasive argument against marching to raise the siege, insisting that the Christian army has a strong defensive position at Sephuria and should stay put. But the Count's cautiousness is met with accusations of cowardice and treachery, mainly from the Templar master, Gerard de Ridefort and Reynaud of Chatillon, who push for a more aggressive stance and put I do understand why they want to be aggressive in this situation. Pressure on King Guy with strong political, military, and diplomatic arguments. Okay. Persuaded, the king sends a herald through the camp to sound the call that the army will march to the rescue of Tiberius at dawn. And on July 3rd, the Crusader army makes way. They so, so, it really worked. It rallied them up. It's out with Raymond of Tripoli commanding the vanguard. King Guy leads the center where the Bishop of Acre carries Christendom's greatest relic, the true cross, on which Christ is believed to have been crucified. Balian of Ibelin commands the rear guard, where the Templars and Hospitaliers are stationed. 
Doesn't this cross get uh, lost or taken away? He orders the men to march with haste, planning to reach the besieged town by the end of the day. But as noon approaches and the sun rises across mm -hmm. the clear, cloudless sky, it becomes apparent that the day will be extremely hot. Mm. There's no breeze and the scorching heat slows down the column. By midday, the army this is when they the get ambushed. The village of Tarun, Remember this. Only one third of the way. But as they press on, there is no escaping the sun and the thick dust raised by the marching troops. It becomes clear to Kengi and his officers that they will not reach Tiberius in a single day. As the column moves away from Tehran, detachments of Saladin's fast-moving horse archers appear from nearby hills and begin harassing the Christians, mm. cutting off their line of retreat. The Crusader infantry this is the first the ambush, to protect the cavalry against hit-and-run attacks, but the number of casualties in men and animals begins to rise. The day wears on, and the constant harassment... I really like how I'm getting a more in-depth in depth detail on like how long it lasted, how long they had to put up with just being surrounded and peppered with uh, arrows. ...and sporadic clashes slowed the Crusader rearguard down mm. to a crawl. They become separated from the rest of the army. Of course they're going to. During the loss of his elite shock cavalry, King Gi orders the centre to stop to allow the rearguard to catch up. He relays the message to Raymond, ordering him to halt the vanguard. Imagine being told that you have to stand still and wait and just defend that position by being while being peppered by arrows. Holy. But as the entire Crusader column gradually gets encircled by the ever-increasing number of Saladin's horse archers, it becomes clear that they have fallen into a trap. After quickly taking Tiberius, Saladin had time to return, leaving only a small garrison to block the citadel. All right. And with his main contingent, he is now blocking the road. With nightfall fast approaching, the exhausted Christian fighters, slowed by thirst and hemmed in by Muslim forces, mm -hmm. cannot fight their way past Saladin's fresh troops. Kengi. They have no choice. Has no choice but to order his men to make camp where they stand. Not far from the king's tent, the main Muslim contingent also encamps for the night. Mm. But the night ahead will be a difficult one for the Crusaders. Their column stretches some two kilometers and it's not protected by any natural terrain features. Muslim horse archers continue to pepper the camp throughout the night. Skirmishes clash with the Crusaders. Literally just getting peppered. Throughout the night as well, you get no time to rest. And set tents on fire along the camp perimeter. Unable to rest, and with their water supplies dwindling, the smoke and the heat from the fire drains the energy from the Christians. Come morning, things quiet down. Saladin. Uh, I've got a um, reaction request for the next two already. So I've got to do lights after this and then something after that. Um, but I'm on until late, so let me know after that one, and I'm sure, sure I'll be happy to get to it. Waits for the heat to rise and to see what the Christians will do. Crusaders, now without any water and tormented by thirst, have only one aim. Mm -hmm. The village of Hatim, where there is a water source. They make way across the valley, keeping the same formation of three squares, with infantry shielding the cavalry. Saladin's troops set fire to the nearby brushwood, sending choking clouds of smoke on a westerly breeze towards the Crusaders. Oh, that's a smart move, and I didn't even think about it. Imagine just having all of that soot, all of that smoke in your face, just having to deal with all of that. Oh, horrible, horrible. Why wow, you're getting pe You can't even see the fucking arrows coming at you. Oh my god, I didn't even think of that at first. You've got all this smoke, you can barely breathe, you can barely see, and you've got arrows coming from you left, right, and center, and you're just holding on to the man next to you, hoping that you can survive. And with the sun beating down from the clear sky, the Christians push on towards Hatim, desperate to reach its water well. To prevent this, Saladin sends Taki al dins wing galloping to block the valley, okay. determined to fully encircle the enemy and not allow them to quench their thirst. He especially Smart. wants to wear down the knights and their cavalry, aware of just how dangerous their frontal mm. charge is. Taki skirmishers, riding close, then hit and run to test the flanks of the Christians. 
Horse archers then unleash volley after volley onto the Crusader column. Exhausted, thirsty and disheartened, the Crusader infantry starts to break away from the mounted knights. Yeah, we knew that was going to happen. They disperse and flee, with a large group heading east towards a hill called the Horns of Hatim, mm. and another group fleeing north towards the village of Nimrin. Getting separated as well. Troops, Muslim riders open gaps in their line to draw out the enemy infantry. King Guy and his officers realize they are doomed unless... It's just a slaughter at this point, right? They can break through. But the Muslims charge the rear of the column, and the Templars mm. and Hospitalias become heavily engaged, forcing Guy to halt for a second time to prevent the cavalry formations from breaking up. Does he actually risk staying? I thought he might have fled. But in the front, Raymond of Tripoli is already edging away from King Guy's cavalry mm -hmm. formation. As he advances, the Muslim riders begin opening another gap in their line. Raymond decides not to sit and wait. He gathers his knights and charges Taki al Din's cavalry. The Muslim riders let the galloping Christians pass through, showering Raymond and his men with arrows as they retreat from the battlefield. And this was covered in the extra history Back version in the as well. Valley, the Christian knights are dying. Mm. The to... But I didn't realize we had the smoke. I didn't realize it was this intense or this brutal. I'm really enjoying this version and how it would be how it's been covered. Move towards the horns of a team through a gap already created by the retreating infantry. He knows that there are shallow pools of water at the top of the hill and hopes they are not dry. Meanwhile, on the hill, Saladin's troops close in and engage the Christian infantry. Exhausted, the enemy infantry barely put up a fight. Okay. Completely overwhelmed. The Muslims then turn towards the king of Jerusalem himself. Throughout the incessant close quarter fighting, Christian knights gather around to protect the true cross mm, as they retreat towards the but hill. They don't, they get slaughtered. But the no, I think they get captured. No relief and no water. King Guy rallies his knights and raises his red tent to provide a focal point, but to no avail. Mm. Muslim troops push up the slope and engage the Christians. In the melee, the true cross falls into Muslim. Oh, yeah, I think this is when the, the tent gets um uh, gets taken down, right? Hands. Seeing this, the surviving Christian knights rally and charge downhill to retrieve it, pushing the Muslim line back. But they have no fight left in them and soon begin to take heavy casualties. You've got to give them that they had the bravery to try and get the true cross back, though. Like, it takes a lot to even attempt that, do you know what I mean? Finally, King Guy orders them to surrender. Mm -hmm. The knights dismount and collapse on the ground. King Guy is also found on the ground at his tent, utterly exhausted, barely having enough strength left to hand over his sword. That is a bit of a eye opener, and you should take that. I'd imagine that's how every soldier feels in these times after a battle. I'd imagine they're always that exhausted that you could just barely hold up. Like, like once the battle's finished, you've got maybe 20, 30 minutes before the pain starts kicking in and that adrenaline starts running out. But otherwise, your body is just filled with adrenaline. Saladin's army has won a great victory. King Guy is captured along with many nobles and knights, mm -hmm. among them, Reynaud of Chatillon. Saladin orders that ice water be brought and offered to the king. Then, according to Imad al-Din, the king, having drunk some of it, handed the cup to Reynaud of Chatillon. Whereupon the sultan said to an interpreter, Say to the king, it is you who give him to drink, but I give him neither to drink nor to eat. By these words, Saladin wishes that it be understood that honor forbade him to harm any man who has tasted his hospitality. And with that, he swings his sword and strikes Reynard on the neck, thus fulfilling his oath to kill the truce breaker. Okay. Okay. That makes so much more sense. That makes so much more sense why that happened. Because in Extra History, Extra Credits versions, it was all just sort of, like, jokingly, and there was no backstory. But he said from the start that he was going to die because of what he said. And 
did an assay he needed to die and i'm glad it happened and it makes so much more sense i'm so glad i've got that extra bit of information to connect the two dots and yeah that was that was great but more importantly the large crusader army that is destroyed at Hattin cannot be replaced without it christian castles towns and cities are now defenseless Mm -hmm. By 1188, only Tyre and Antioch hold out to spur Europe to embark on another crusade. Mate. That is a story for another time. Another time it indeed. It is worth noting that we mainly focused on Saladin's military achievements in this video. But there is much more to the man who was admired by his European mm. enemies and loved by his fellow Muslims. Saladin was a courageous Muslim leader whose firm foundation in the religion and its prime values led to his commitment to the Islamic cause. In just 12 years, he united Mesopotamia, Syria, Egypt, Eastern Libya, Western Arabia and Yemen, using his skills in diplomacy and administration to piece together this divided region. Very strong. His scope of vision was that he gave each situation its due attention and weight, and he never broke a bridge of diplomacy or peace initiative with his opponents. Mm. The power or wealth he acquired never spoiled him. He was a man of restless energy, geared to serve his goal in driving the invaders out of Muslim lands. We highly recommend wow. you check out the sources we That's used for this video. Very impressive. Very, very impressive, and what an incredible man. More about one of the greatest princes of Islam. I would definitely like to know more. If you enjoyed the video, Saladin's victory at the